Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Welcome to Atomic Game Theory. Uh, this is Game School, the show where we are taking a look at different board games and talking about the conflict theory and the math that makes them great, makes us love them all. Uh, my name, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Welcome to Atomic Game Theory. There we go. We're official now. We're official. Uh, my name is Richard, and if you have any questions about anything we're talking about through the show, this is a class setting, so feel free to post those. If you were watching on Twitch, just post them there in the chat. You can also tweet them at me at Armelina, and we will try our best to get to all of them uh, throughout the course of the show. Oh my gosh, I'm really excited for today. We've got two fantastic games that I cannot wait to talk a ton about. They are both a lot of fun in very, very different ways. Uh, one of them is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm just, I'm so excited. Um, real quick check in on the Twitch chat. Awesome. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Everyone there. Uh, you're, you're the best. Um, like I said, any questions at any time, at any time. Uh, but I have to start right now. I'm just so excited. I don't want to wait anymore. I got to jump right into Rise of Tribes. I love this game. I love it so much. Um, this is a fantastic game by, uh, by Breaking Games by Brad Brooks. There he is right there. Um, it is Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's a pretty expansive game. It's a ton of fun. Uh, it is a game of developing your uh, your people through through this board um, to become better and better and better by gaining, you know, what every um, empire needs, victory points. Uh, <laughs> and you do that in a whole lot of different ways as this game progresses. So I want to show you what the board looks like and talk you through this. And, um, and as we go, we'll, we'll talk about how game theory fits into this whole deal right here. But first, the game. Here we have Rise of Tribes. I've got this set up for two players right now. So we have kind of a smaller board. The more players you have, the larger the board is. But this is a, a game of area control. We have our, our hex grid down here that represents the world. Um, we have our, our little meeples. I already love. I don't know if I can get these... All the meeples are different. They've got different symbols, different things they're holding. I love that. The yellow ones have like axes or something. It's They're great. They're all great. Um, and one of the big things about this game is, is the way that you interact with the world is very intriguing. You'll notice right away that while I said it's an area control game, I have places on the board. This is kind of like a mid-game setup where there are two different players in the exact same hex because this game is area control but not necessarily about fighting although it can be and it it is quite a bit <laughs> um as the game goes each one of these hexes can have a bunch of meeples in it a bunch of people and it doesn't matter who owns those people as long as there are five or fewer combat will only happen in this game if at any moment there are five or more than five meeples in one spot so think about that as we're, we're kind of progressing through this because you have a lot of options um, in how this game works, and um, area control, 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 light on control. <laughs> Let's talk about the fun parts about this game, why I love this game. You were trying to develop your empire to get to 15 points on our victory point track right here, and you have a number of ways that you can do that. Uh, number one is you can build villages, and these villages are destroyable, so be careful, you have to defend them. But they will generate one victory point every single round, which pushes you up very, very quickly. Um, there are also goals in the game. This deck is chock full of goodness and goals and technology and things like that that will help you develop as you get towards the end of the game. And that is one of the, I mean, the, the biggest way to get victory points. Those are kind of like the two major strategies. Get a bunch of villages and just watch these victory points pile up or run through this deck, churn through it, get the good stuff. How do you do that? Okay, well, good question. Good question that I have. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, just for the record, yes, this is, I am, I don't know if it's totally visible. This is, oh, can I, can I hop back real fast? Um, this is an official Double Clicks t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> um, okay. In this game, you have, on your turn, the ability to take two actions. There are four possible actions, and up here on the board, you can see exactly what they are. They are grow, move, gather, and lead. And what those do is they allow you to mess with this board, gather resources, 
and draw these cards so that you can actually work towards goals in the game. And intro steps. Let's, let's do this light. If you decide to grow, you get to take three meeples and put them onto the board in a place where you already have people. So if red were to grow, they could certainly grow into this spot where their village is. They would then need to move because you can't have that many people there. Your population will decrease until it gets to five or fewer. So um, they could certainly, as their other action, take the move action. Move is take four of your tribe members and move them one space. You cannot move the same one twice. They all have to be different. However, I could certainly move this one into this space and then take the other one that was there and move it down here. So that's all that stuff is legal. That's no problem. Um, like I said, you want to get into uh, hexes where there are five or fewer people unless you want to initiate combat. Why would you want to do that? Because the third action is gathering resources. To gather resources, there are these little resources in the game. There are fish, there are wood, there are stone. Yes, stone. <laughs> or um, I was even in Catan. I never did, you know, whatever they're called. <laughs> I love them. Um, you need to gather these resources. And you can only gather them from hexes of the same type. You'll see that the board is built out of mountain hexes, lake hexes, and woodland hexes, forests. So if you are not in hexes like that, you cannot gather those resources. The ability is very clear. It says pick two hexes and gain two resources for each of those hexes. So in this case, this is pretty advanced. Everybody basically has all the choices in the world. But red could pick these two hexes right here, a lake and a forest, and gather two wood and two fish. Um, they could also, of course, pick two two lake hexes, excuse me, and gain four fish. All that stuff is totally legal, doesn't it's totally fine. Um, so you want to be in these places. You'll see that kind of the mountains are are in the middle on this board in particular. They are places where there could be a lot of combat. And if you don't have a representative there, then you are not getting stone. Uh, and you need stone. <laughs> you really, really do. Lastly is the lead action, and uh, and you just draw two cards off this deck. And just to show you what's up in this deck, we'll see if we can get this up here. There are a lot of, this is a technology card, and what it says is, hey, if you have two wood and one fish, you get one victory point, and then you get to gather from an additional hex. So every time you take the gather action, instead of two hexes for two resources, you get three hexes, two resources each. Um, mysticism, draw an extra lead card. Horses, your tribe members may move two hexes instead of one. Um, pottery, whenever you grow, you get to add two additional tribe members, and so on and so on. There are also, in here, goal cards. Boom. Build the entire tribe. If you have all 20 of your meeples on the board at any one point, you gain four victory points, which is, you need 15, so that seems pretty good. Um... Uh, occupy any eight hexes with your tribe members. Just occupy. You just have to be there. Um, red is currently in one, two, three, four, five, six. That's pretty fantastic. There are more hexes with more players, so that might get easier in a bigger game. But in this one, it would not be hard for red to, at the end of their turn, jump into two more of these hexes. There wouldn't be combat. There wouldn't be anything. It'd be just fine. We get into a couple questions in here about control, because I did say this was an area control game, and there is the ability to control a hex or have majority in a hex or occupy a hex. Those are all different different levels of area control. Red controls this hex because they're the only player in there. Uh, red has majority in this hex because it is more than half of the tribe members there. And red occupies this hex because, and I mean all the rest of them too. So as you're looking at these goals, those words might come up and they might ask you to do certain specific things. Okay, okay, so there's the, the basic turns of the game um but it's better than that it's better than that because <laughs> here's what i wanted to talk about this week and uh and to answer a question from the chat that i have just seen the the reason we're talking about this game rise of tribes and our other game shipwreck arcana which we'll chat about later is because of the mechanic i'm about to describe which is the coolest thing about this game in my i mean i love so much about this game but this is my favorite thing which is these dice up here which i haven't talked about at all this game allows you to develop a history 
which is one of the coolest ideas I could think about in a game. Uh, your turn is affected by past turns, right? Uh, it's not true that you will necessarily grow your tribe and get three tribe members. It depends on what the past has been like and what your turn is like exactly. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> on your turn, the very first thing you're actually going to do is you're going to roll these two dice. And these dice have three sides on them. There's the sun. Oops, let's get out here. There's a sun, there's a moon, and there is a blank. Um, and that is good, bad, and neutral, kind of. <laughs> and all of these actions up here, their value changes based on what it's been like lately. So I'm going to take my dice. I'm going to roll them. Oh, perfect. I get, a, I get a sun and I get a moon. So when I take my two actions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these dice and I'm going to place it to the left side of the dice that are up here. And then I'm going to move them over take the one on the far right, put it down beneath, and now the state of those dice tells me what my turn is actually going to be like. I look up there and I see that there are two moons. Well, if there are two moons, I actually only get to grow two tribe members, not three. Um, if there were two suns, if I had instead placed this one up here, fantastic, now I get four tribe members when I grow. My turn, my ability to, to do cool stuff here is based on what has come before, and I that is such a an interesting, intricate mechanic. Oh my gosh, I can't, I'm just, I'm so excited even thinking about it because it means that I, I have so many more options. This is a very, very cool part of the game. Um, I might decide that what I want is a huge grow action. So I'm going to add a, a second sun here to get that four tribe members. I place them all on the board, but I don't really need to move them that far. So maybe I want a, a weak move action right here. Um, and I get my two two moons there. So I'm willing to take that at kind of like uh, a hit in order to make sure that my grow is as good as possible. I have goals. I have things I want to do specifically. Speaking of goals, maybe what I want to do is draw more cards. Well, if I get a two sun move over here instead, bam, 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 there we go. Um, I get to draw three cards instead of two. I'm already able to have more goals and have more technologies available to me that I can possibly be solving and working through. So this lets me run through this deck faster, which is very cool. Finally, Gather is also on that track. If I have two suns there, I choose three tiles that I control and I gain two resources from each of them. So if it has been sunny recently, it I don't have to be the one who places the second sun right here on lead. That is still a two sun setup, even though I place this dark one, this this neutral knight. Oh my gosh. Okay, so history lets me have a better turn than it would otherwise. My turn is defined by what the other players have done. That's very cool. But also, it means that if I have a terrible roll, what if I roll garbage like a moon and a blank? I'm not getting the suns I want. Well, that's actually bad for everybody at the table because by placing those into the actions, I am making turns worse in the future. My own bad luck has hurt every other player in the game. Because if I drop another moon right here into move, well, look, now there's two moons. Okay, that's bad for me. But the next player is also going to have two moons. So theirs is going to be worse. And what if they also decide, eh, I, I rolled a moon, maybe instead of putting a blank there, I'll put another moon there. What if it's just moons forever? What if we're all so excited by lead actions that there are three suns there? Now on my turn, it doesn't matter what I put in that spot. I'm going to get the double sun, which is fantastic. So I can use that to my advantage. I can I can be watchful. I can be paying attention to, to how that is set up so that I can take the, the most efficient actions for my turn. But it is not guaranteed that I will get the most advantageous rolls or, or, or board setup by the time it comes around to my turn. Especially with more players, this thing can change pretty dramatically by the time it get back, gets back to my turn. In a two-player game, I've got a little bit more control about how this whole thing works. But it is a, a beautiful and elegant way to think about adding history to a game, which I find very interesting. There are a lot of games that there is no history on my turn, like... I can just fall asleep and then on my turn wake up and then be like, ooh, this is really, really neat. And that's the idea we're going to be talking about in just a little bit with some solid math. But for now, sticking with Rise of Tribes. <laughs>
uh, 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 yes, yes, everything is, the weather mechanic is, yes, the weather mechanic, that's what that is, it's fantastic, I love it, it's so fun, <laughs> um, also in this game we have a few other things to kind of mix it up that I want to just point out real quick because it is right now it's not just these moves there's plenty more stuff going on and even that's like even with these cards and the randomness here trying to get my villages set up the potential combat and clashes that happen I haven't even talked about combat okay hold on before we get to the other cool stuff if let's say red decides to hustle on in here and adds a whole bunch of there we go. Now there's like seven people in this space right in the center tile. You might expect that in a game you would start rolling dice and having to do a whole bunch of difficult stuff because combat is a thing that you want to be random, that you want to uh, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, strategy, right? Combat in this is dead simple. Are there more than five meeples in that spot? Check. Yes, there are. Then take one from every player and continue that process until only one player's color remains in that space. That's it. That's the whole thing. So by doing this big, huge move right here and getting five red and two green in here, that means red and green are both going to lose one. Red and green are both going to lose another one until red has full control of the tile. They have each lost two meeples. They'll go back to their bases, whatever. Um, and the game will continue. So I, I love that combat mechanic because it is so clean and so simple. And also because tactically I can plan for that. If my job is to control places because I have a goal for that, or if I want to kick someone out, all that stuff is really, really important. If I want to destroy a village, then if I want to destroy your village, I need to control the square, or the hex rather, that your village is on. Which can be difficult if it's way back here. I mean, I, I gotta move a whole bunch of troops back here to try and stop you. I mean, that's not enough. That's only five. I have to get another one in here. I need to make sure that there are more than five meeples in that spot or combat doesn't even happen, which is great. And then again, two and two until only red dominates this space and controls it. And then this village is destroyed and returned to the stock. This is really important because this victory points meter can ramp so quickly and if you're getting points every single turn based on villages you can run away with this game in no time uh that makes it seem like this game should last something like 15 terms turns there we go um or 15 rounds at the very least you should get 15 turns i don't know that i've ever seen a game go 15 turns i think it goes a lot faster than that it kind of depends um this is a game that once you get it down you're playing this in like 20 30 minutes it is, it is a ramp, and it is tons and tons of fun. I love games that ramp, so here's a great one. Um, let's take a look at the player boards real quick, just so you get to see the last few parts of this game. Uh, the player boards are pretty incredible. I'll make sure I get that right there. Um, great art. I really like them a lot. The player board has two things that are of primary importance to you. Uh, on the left... Well, there's the order of play. So in case you've forgotten how that works, it's all right there. It's really, really clear. Um, scoring villages, rolling dice, take your actions, then resolve any conflicts on the board. That's important. You don't resolve any conflicts until the end of your turn. Um, and then you can build villages and complete goals um, from this deck. Uh, on the right down here at the bottom are the resources that are required for you to build a village. And they are all different. Um, I mean, they're not dramatically different, but you can see that those are all different resource costs right there in order to build a village. So everyone's on the lookout for slightly different things. You'll know this at the start of the game, and probably you're going to make placements that help you build villages as soon as possible. What else is cool about these player boards? Well, if you flip them over, they have amazing character art for the leaders of these tribes. And I, I these are just, they're just great. They're just really, really good. Um, once you've got the game down and you don't need to be looking at the rules because you know how it works, you can look at this cool character art as well. Um, also, because they were really excited about these leaders, there is a an advanced way to play called the Leaders Expansion, and it is in the official game. It gives you these little tiles right here, and there is one for each tribe. It is two-sided, and both of the sides are different. So when you decide to play the Indartsu tribe, you will basically search through here for the Indartsu. There it is, right there. And you get to choose one of these two abilities, Exogamy or Farming. Okay. 
Farming, when taking the grow action, add one additional tribe member in each hex containing your villages. Okay, pretty cool, pretty cool. Um, obviously, it immediately changes the way you're going to play this game. Exogamy, once per turn, you may pay another player two resources to convert one of their tribe members to yours in a hex you both occupy. That's a cool way to just suddenly start taking control of hexes that only have one person in it. If I'm playing against the Indartsu, I need to watch out for that really bad and make sure I have two people in the square as often as possible. Um, these go all over the place. These are really, really cool. They change the game dramatically. Um, where is one of my favorite ones? Ambush, the Kaha. Uh, you may grow to your player board. I guess Kaha right over here. Oh, that's the Kiki. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> um, if you trigger conflict and took a move or grow action, you may add any member from your player board to hexes in combat. So you would you would have these actually off your board. And when you took a grow action, you would say, I'm putting them right here instead. And then as the game progresses, whenever you move or whenever you trigger conflict, <laughs> you, you can place these onto the space. It's like a little surprise attack, which is very cool. Uh, one of them lets you uh, have a village here on your player board, and it's not attackable, um, which is pretty gross. It has to be your second one at the very least, but whoo. Now I can't stop you from gaining a victory, victory point every single turn. <laughs> um the Tunga, uh, light in the dark after your roll and before resolving uh, events, you may pay one resource per die to change moons into suns on the dice that you rolled. So I could take that moon, turn it into a sun. I am destined to have better turns. Whew. So these are fun. I, I don't recommend playing with them game one, maybe not even game two, because there's a lot going on already. But they are a very fun way to add some major variation to this game. Do, do, do. Oh my gosh, so many questions in the chat. I'm just checking in re real quick right here. Uh, double clicks live. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> um, uh, it's talking a lot about the dice in here. Ooh, is this a perfect information game? Hold on to that for just a moment because I we're going to be talking about that very, very shortly. Um, we're also, let's see, your own bad luck's effect is sort of variable in terms of its effect on others depending on the number of players. So absolutely, when we're talking about these dice and how they work, and the, the history of the mechanic, if I'm having bad luck, that messes with other players' future turns. But if everyone is having bad luck, then that absolutely, you know, turns into this place where the game is just dark. We are having a dark and stormy um, setup over here, which is fantastic. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, uh, oh, my gosh. We, people hosting. Hi, everybody. How's, how's it going? How's it going? Um we're taking a look at Rise of Tribes right now, and we're talking mostly about the, the dice mechanic over here, uh, which is why I wanted to talk about this game. It is a a wonderful little uh, history mechanic that builds momentum as the game progresses. So on your turn, you're basically going to roll a couple dice, and... Ooh, that's a terrible roll. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to change that. <laughs> uh, you're going to take these dice, and you are going to place them on the left side of one of these actions. Ba-bam, ba-bam. You're going to push them all over. And one of these actions will come down. And then you get to look at the remainder, the dice that are still here. And based on what's going on here, uh, I see I have two suns. That tells me that it is a sunny day in the lead action. And I'm going to get to do something better than I would have otherwise. If there are two moons in there, I get to do something worse than I would otherwise. And if it's one of each or a bunch of, you know, darkness in there, whatever else... Um, <laughs> Then you only get to do the basic action for two cards, two resources, things like that. So what I care about for the most part in this game is how it builds history over time. It gives us this ability to, to change the future. And I will totally say that it gives you the ability to mess with other people. Because this right here is one of my favorite moves to do. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm a monster. Hello. <laughs> um... What I want to do on any turn, because I'm a game theorist and I want to be as selfish as possible, is I want to have a really, really good turn while leaving garbage turns for the future. Because I've put a moon here, my other, you know, my next player, my opponent, is going to have to roll a sun if they want a double sun action there. And if they roll and they get this, they get a blank and a moon, they have to put the blank there. Because if they put the moon there, they're going to get the worst possible action. So now suddenly... They're in this tactical position where they have to, like, really, really be careful with how they place their dice because I 
messed it up for them. They are, not only are they dealing with the fact that I was unlucky on my turn, but I have sabotaged them. Oh my gosh, it's fun. Okay, don't when the first time you play this game, you don't have to sabotage people. But I've played a couple tournaments of Rise of Tribes, and I, as mean as possible. That's primary goal. That is <laughs> that is how game theory works. Oh my gosh. Okay, so beautiful, beautiful, wonderful game. There's also oh last thing. There is an event deck in here as well. This drastically changes the nature of the game. There's a ton of these. Anytime you roll doubles on your turn, an event comes up as long as. Uh, there are not already two events in play. Um, and they can do a whole lot of things, like invaders. There could be an invasion, and then suddenly there's invaders on one of the hexes on the sides. And in order to control that hex, you have to beat them all, but there's like five of them. And you get victory points for doing it, which is cool, but it's hard to do. Or what if there's a mammoth hanging out at a lakeside hex? Do you want to go and control that mammoth? Make it your, excuse me, make it your friend. Or do you want to hunt it? gain a bunch of food resources by hunting that mammoth. Uh, do you want stone walls around your villages so that they're harder to to destroy? Do you want, this is shared knowledge. Um, if you share hexes with opponents, you can pay resources here um, and just draw goal cards from it. Uh, once there's like three tokens on here, they're gone. Uh, drought, the population limit changes to four instead of five. These are all pretty darn fantastic. There's a bunch of them. Plentiful Stone, which just has a bunch of stone. You just put six stone. There we go, Glare. <laughs> you put six stone markers, like tokens down here, onto this card. And anytime you gather resources to get more stone, you get even more stone. Uh, and of course, everyone's favorite, the volcano. Just a volcano appears, and it's terrible. Everything's bad <laughs> from then on. Sabertooth Tiger. There's a canoe. There's just so much, so many ways to modify this game based on how the events come out as well. So Rise of Tribes. Beautiful, wonderful. I love this game. I love it so much. You should definitely track down and play this game. The only sad thing for me is that I, I do not have the deluxe tiles that came out. Um, you can get them at some stores as well. They, they turn a lot of these tokens into tiles, which is a lot of fun. There's like this actual mammoth that runs around, an actual Sabertooth Tiger, which is a ton of fun. What else? Anything else on this one? Um, there are expansions coming out as well, which I have been fortunate to be able to playtest because Brad Brooks is a designer down here in LA and we get to play together in the First Play LA group, which I keep talking about. If you're excited about playing games, find yourself a prototype group. You get to play so many games. It's fantastic. All right. Rise of Tribes. Rise of Tribes. I'm going to check the chat real quick, see if there are any last minute questions on Rise of Tribes. Oh, thank you so much for for running through what's going on in this whole thing. It is this whole entire Game School episode will be posted on YouTube at some point, so you can come back and check out the whole thing, or you can check out the... the. Do we say VOD or VOD? I don't know. Either one. Later. <laughs> um, so that you can check out everything we've talked about so far. Oh, boy. Oh, gosh. Okay. Rise of Tribes. I love Rise of Tribes. It's such a fun game. Um... And the biggest thing about it is just this history through dice. It is it is a very clever thing, and it's rare that games give us that opportunity to build a history and work with a history in games. And in fact, it's really what I wanted to talk about today. I want to talk about, first of all, as we kind of transition into some mathy stuff, I want to talk about a Russian mathematician named Andrei Markov. And Markov was really big into decision-making and looking at game theory and, and those sorts of decisions in a sense of what are the possible outcomes and how does my current state of affairs tell me about those future outcomes. And <laughs> more than that, uh, let's check out Markov's big thing, what we remember him for the most. This idea that a game or a move can be Markovian or memorylessness, or have this uh, this quality of memorylessness. There we go. I just like saying that word. Um, his idea, if something was Markovian, it meant that the future depends only on the present game state and not the past. And he's, of course, talking about economics. He's talking about politics. He's talking about all these other things. And you can get a sense about what he's talking about if you think about, oh, let's do some foreign affairs real quick. Okay, this is this is minor. This is not my deal. But uh, if, if someone were to step into a conflict in a set of distant countries and try to solve that conflict without taking notice of what those parties 
have thought in the past or have battled in the past, right? If there's a long-term sort of enmity there, then it is difficult to change the state and you're thinking about it kind of in a, a bad way. That is a huge problem with uh, foreign affairs all the time um, with any country <laughs> is that if you don't research a, a you know, an event properly, you may not have the information that you need in order to make the positive changes that you want to because there's a conflict going on. There's a long history of whatever else that you have to take into consideration. Okay, that was that was weird. That was a big one. Um, what's another good one? Um, well, I really just, I mean, I, this is not what I do. I don't come up with these in, in context of politics or, or economics. What I do is I talk about them in terms of games. And so let's, let's think about this conversation that I had with, uh, with Dave Chalker, like last year sometime, um, made me really, really think about what is going on in these games. So I want to transition to some slides. Uh, we came up with a definition or rather I did because I am, um, you know, me, a, a nerd. <laughs> I came up with this idea for our Markovian game and a Markovian game had to fulfill both of these equivalent definitions and these are both they mean the same thing right that's that's what equivalent means uh and it makes them markovian number one is this idea that having knowledge of past turns does not increase the optimization of future turns the heck does that mean well we'll take a look at a couple examples and try and sort that out but basically it means that at any moment you should be able to tell what the best move is um you don't need to necessarily excuse me um, know everything that has happened in the game up to that point in order to figure that out. Uh, our second definition here, momentum. Okay, well, that's a weird term. Momentum cannot be gained during the game except by random chance. Well, we don't talk about game momentum a whole lot. And really, when I'm talking about momentum here, I'm talking about it in a physics sense. Momentum is something that you gain over time based on your velocity and your mass. So if something is accelerating... Your momentum is increasing uh, as time passes. So this game means that there cannot be that kind of momentum. I cannot figure out, like, I don't have plans. I don't build up. I just kind of hang out at this idea of where I am. That was a bad way to think about it. Um, I, I do not learn anything by, by remembering everything that has happened so far in a game. I really just can focus right on now, and that tells me everything I need. Okay. I'm going a little theoretical right here, so I need to immediately jump into a couple examples to kind of show you what I mean. So here are a couple of my favorite games. And whether or not they are Markovian in nature. And again, Markovian means I don't need the past to tell me what is best to do right now. <sighs> Betrayal at House on the Hill is absolutely Markovian. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I really don't need to know much. At any moment, I could basically wake up and take a look at the board, and I would know everything about what I'm supposed to be doing at any time. Um, that's probably true in the first half of the game. In the second half of the game, I would say things change a little bit because you are now battling for some sort of plot or plan, and probably, um, you know, you need to be a little bit more careful about how you consider that. I'm setting up games in the background of this. Sorry about that, everybody. If you hear some weird noises, that's what's going on. Um, now a game like Dominion is of course not a Markovian game. It is a deck builder and any deck builder fails this definition because a deck builder is about building your deck over time, right? You kind of need to know a lot of things. So you need to know what's in your deck. You need to know, um, what options you have available to you at any moment. Um, what could come up next? What should I buy is very, very dependent on, you know, what I already have. Uh, Laser Riders. I was talking about this game. I love this game. Uh, this is a game, it's very, it's basically like Tron Light Cycles. <laughs> um, totally Markovian. At any moment, you could just decide what you want to do based on the board state. doesn't really, really matter. Um, think about it this way. If someone could tag in to the game for you, could they play just as well as you could? Cool. It's a Markovian game. Uh, Machi Koro, Cards Against Humanity, no big deal. You can just tag in and out all the time. It's not a problem. Um, games that have histories, vast is terrible. Hearts is terrible. Hearts is definitely not Markovian because you do build up this momentum over time. So the big idea with a Markovian game, which is not an official definition, do not, I don't know, I said it. So there you go. <laughs> it's official enough. Um, is, is about whether or not your 
you can build momentum. You can build a plan, and that plan is dependent on move after move after move. Uh, Rise of Tribes. Is it Markovian? Well, I mean, sort of. Sort of, in a sense. There are a couple things that keep a game from being Markovian, for sure. And one of them is about whether or not it is a perfect information game. Perfect information is is a kind of game. <laughs> I meant to have a little thing and I don't have it. So just pretend it says perfect information right here. Um, perfect information games are ones where you can tell everything that's going on. You know the entire state of the game just by looking at it and you have that ability at any moment. Um, chess is a perfect information game because when you look at it, you see everything. There are no secrets. You don't have a hand of cards that you don't know. So you can plan everything out perfectly. Your strategy is dependent on the board state, not necessarily. And I mean, I also know my opponent. We could bring that into it as well. If my opponent is someone that I know has the potential to do some pretty tricky things, that's part of my analysis. I might be able to analyze that person. I don't necessarily know exactly what they're going to do, and that's not, not a big deal in the game. Um, good example of a game that is not perfect information, which is also has this big thing. Oh my gosh, there's so much chat in here. I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out in just a second. Um, as soon as I get this this down, um, uh, where'd I go? Risk. Risk is almost perfect information. It's very very close. You you see the board. You see the armies on the board. You can plan based on that strategy. However, you've got those dumb cards, and those cards make it a little bit unclear when you are allowed to do an extra build armies action and add more troops to the game. It kind of depends on you know a whole lot of things. Um, in that game, you get five... Well, you keep drawing cards, and you can turn in if they all have the same symbol or if you have one of three symbols, like all three of the symbols. And so as long as you have five cards... Well, as soon as you get your fifth card, you can definitely turn in. But, I, you know, if it's three or four, I'm not sure if you can do it. So there's a, it's a pretty perfect information game, but not totally. Um, uh, let's see, what's, what's a terribly not perfect... An imperfect information game? Well... I don't want to say flux, but yes, flux. Um, let's see. I'm just looking behind me at all these games that we have going on up here. Uh, Onitama is a perfect information game. It's fantastic. I love that game. Um, or at least it leads into it pretty quickly because there's that's a game where two players are battling. There's only five moves you can do in the game. And as you do a move, you pass it to your opponent so that they can do kind of the same moves. So there's a moment maybe right now. You know all the moves. You know what every player has at any moment. Um, well, diamonds, diamonds is just like hearts. Hearts is definitely not perfect information. You never know what cards other people have. The game is based on the uncertainty and how that whole thing works. So I love the idea of perfect information and it, it really, really dictates what a game is like. If a game is perfect information, it is absolutely 100% by necessity Markovian. I'm just thinking about that in my head to make sure that's true. That seems pretty darn true. I'd have to do a proof and I'm not... I don't have a chalkboard, so I can't do any math on it. But uh, but you should be able to, because it's perfect information, perfect information, track it at all points. Now, chess is a little weird, and I do want to talk about this for a moment, just to kind of wrap this up, because chess is a game where you are building a strategy over time, right? There are openings and movements and blah, 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 um, right? You're supposed to be predicting 10 turns in advance. So if you and I, like you're playing and you're good at it and you swap out with me and I look at the board... If I can't like go backwards and see those strategies and see what you're doing, am I playing the game as well as you? Interesting thought. I mean, I can evaluate the board and make my own decisions about what's going on based on the board state. I don't know enough about chess to know if that's true. If we're talking checkers, 100%. That's no big deal. If I look at checkers, I can tell what's going on. <laughs> okay, checking in on the chat. Ooh, Salty Horse, thank you so much. That push and do action from Rise of Tribes is in a couple other places. That is very cool. Um, oh, just Ulm. Well, I do want to check it out because it's so good. It's so good. Um, it's just, it feels really, really nice to have your turn come around and then roll and be surprised at how good or how bad or how mediocre your turn is actually going to be. You can't tell until you do that, that die roll, although you can get a sense based on the history of what everybody else has been doing. So that is very, very cool. Let's see here. Uh, yes, absolutely. This is, uh, uh, oh my gosh. Um, is that Malachi the Red? I was going to say the haunts are specifically not Markovian. Absolutely. In in uh, Betrayal at House on the Hill, the haunts, you've got to have plans for that game or, or you're doomed. I will say that when I play the game, I also don't have, it's not technically Markovian because I, 
am a monster and I know where some of those rooms are in the house and I know that some of them are more beneficial and I run for them. So I have plans even from the start of that game. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we got? Um, oh yeah, so if we're talking about chess AI, that's a very good, good idea about past plans. Does a chess AI look at past moves of the opponents as they calculate what they should be doing, or are they just playing optimally for the board state as they see it? Uh, good, I'm, I'm very glad I got your name right. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. I want to, yeah, everyone's name should be right, you know? Should be the name you want. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, okay, so what are we at? The oven says it is 1140, so I want to transition into game number two and talk a little bit more about this idea of history with a game that plays with history in a very, very cool way. I have set this up while the camera was not on. I may have to do some quick readjusting. I even changed the camera height. Did you know? Did you know? Who knows? Let's see. Aha! Nope. Screwed that one up. This is a game that we call The Shipwreck Arcana. And I love this game. It is a pretty ridiculous game. Uh, it's beautiful is one of the things I like about it. It's not a very large game, so I don't need a ton of space here. Really. Um, oh, my face is still in the way of that card. Anyway. <laughs> The way this game works, I have this set up as a three-player game right now. This is a game of deduction. Um, we have this bag full of tiles in here, and you are trying to guess what tiles your fellow players have. This is a cooperative game. Whew, I love it. I love it. Okay. What tiles could they have? It's just the numbers one through seven, and this bag is filled with three tiles of each number. And so on your turn, you're going to mix this all up. You're going to draw two tiles, and you're going to put them, you're going to look at them secretly, and what do I have? I have a one and a six. All right, and then I'm going to put them down in front of me. Okay, now my job here is to try to get the other players to guess what my tile is that I'm going to hold on to. I have two tiles. I'm going to keep one of them, and I'm going to use the other one as a clue. Okay, so here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> my options that I have available to me are based on the cards that I have out here. Um, first of all, these are, oh gosh, are we, are we close enough? The, uh, these are all tarot style. Like the theme here is that we are, I believe we are on a sinking island. I'm actually not sure. It's a very mystical concept in nature. It doesn't, not required to play the game. Although it, it's very, very cool. But we have these tarot cards and they're going to help guide us through the whole process. So I have to place one of my tiles onto these four cards. Um, now what happens here is whatever they say, I have to, that, that has to be a true thing. So let's, let's take an example before this is going to get confusing real quick. This is the lower card, the midnight card. And it says, if one of your fates is lower than the other, play the lower one here. Okay, cool. So that means that my tiles were a, a six and a one, right? So I could place the one on this tile and I place it face up. And what that tells everybody is something about the tile that I kept. It must be higher than a 1 because I put a 1 there. It's not super useful in this case. Unfortunately, most of the tiles are higher than a 1. Uh, I have plus or minus 2. If one of my fates is exactly 2 more or 2 less than the other fate, that's what these are called, fates, uh, then I can play one of them here. I am not actually, I'm not in a position where I can do that, so... I can't place there. <laughs> same. If both of your fates are the same, play one of them here. And then we also have free in this case. Free says play one of your fates here. Just do it. Um, I don't further your doom when I fade. Okay. Okay. If you cannot play anywhere else, play one of your fates here. This is the hours. This is the, the tracker of the game. Can I actually play this somewhere else? Um, move it blue. I'm going to drop this down just a little bit. Um, because it's important to see the turn tracker here. Um, if you cannot play anywhere else, play one of your fates here, then move it one card to the right. So it would automatically come to this lower one. The cards, these, so we're giving people these clues about what our, our withheld token might be. And then at the end of the turn, they get to try and guess what that is. And so I'm trying to make a placement with one of my tiles, which as nearly as possible gives people the, the understanding of what my tiles could be, right? And they want to guess them. All these tiles out in front of me are not mine. They're for my, my friends, my, my, you know, my cooperative what are we, teammates. That's the word I'm looking for. 
And uh, for example, if I had placed a one here, they would know that my other token, the six, was higher than a one. And so they might say, hey, flip your one down so that we don't bother guessing about that anymore. And then since they don't have a lot of information, we move to the next player and they continue. This game is about not only deducing what tile I have, but what tiles everyone has as we go through the game, which is totally wild. Um, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it gets really tricky because you're trying to remember a whole lot of stuff and trying to remember what's going on with these. And now, for sure, you might later on say, well, I know that you don't have a one because there was a one here. I might draw a new tile. It might be a one. Who the heck knows? You know, so that that's going to change things up pretty quick. But uh, but the big thing that happens in this game is that these cards fade. And that was a word that got used earlier is that they fade. If at any moment and we take a look at the, the number of moon symbols on the bottom, uh, lower is a three moon. This is a one, a one and a one because they are very, very specific, right? If I had two fours and I placed a four here, you would know I had a four perfectly. You can guess that four. Um, if you guess my tile correctly, then over here on our time tracker, we have a good and a bad symbol. And if I get a good, I'm going to advance it by one if you guessed mine correctly. We need to guess seven correctly in order to win the game. And we need to do that before Doom happens seven times. Um, at least on easy mode, you can push the Doom tracker up if you want a harder game. The Doom tracker goes up when these cards fade. So you gotta be really, really careful about how you use them. It also goes up, I believe, if we make a bad choice or a bad guess. Um, I'm pretty confident that's how that works, but who knows? I'd have to look at the rules and they're right over there, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, so you don't want to use these too hastily because they will fade and get us closer to the end. However, 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 I'll waggle my finger out here. When you do have these fade, each one of these cards has an ability on the back that you are allowed to use one time. And these abilities make it a little bit easier to guess what's going on. Look at that autofocusing camera. This one says twice before making a prediction, the group may discard this to make one extra prediction this turn. So that's a very helpful way to get more predictions on the board. This one, oh, that's twice. That's the same one. This is a very powerful one. This is a 147. Before making a prediction, this group may discard this to ask if your fate is a 14 or 7. You could ask questions. Maybe, you know, I have the 1 and the 7 flipped over at this point, so you don't think it's either one of those, and then you ask that question, and if I say yes, perfect. There, now you know what's up. Once these have faded, they go off to the side, and we get new cards, and there are Many, 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 many cards. They're all very, very cool. I really love the artwork in this. And they also uh, just put out uh, two expansions, I think. Um, at least one expansion on Kickstarter, and this is why I have a copy of the game. It sold out very quickly. Let me add another one on there, <laughs> just so it looks good. Uh, it sold out very, very quickly on Kickstarter, and, um, and no one could find it, and so they knew they wanted to do a new, a new printing, and now here we are with this one. Um, checking in on the Twitch. Um, uh, yes, so the phrasing on the lower card makes it sound mandatory. Absolutely. When you place on one of these fates, you must do exactly what it says. Uh, you cannot place here if you do not follow that rule, which is what the hours is for. So if you absolutely cannot place on anything else, you place on the hours, it pushes it here to the first one, which makes this one a little bit more likely to start fading. Um, and fading is bad, especially if it's you don't gain any information out of it. And also by looking at this tile, if there's a one there, I'm that's that doesn't mean anything. Now I'm kind of losing track of what it means. Uh, later on in the game, you know these all have like ones and twos on them. I believe there are some, uh, oops, fours in here as well. Or is three the highest? There are some fours as well. Um, I'm not actually sure who played which tile here. So I don't really, really know, um, you know, the best way to to parse that logic out among these three players as the game progresses. It's it's harder to use these numbers as the game passes. So you have to immediately say, well, I know that that one means that this can't be a one. So flip that token over so that we can remember here. This is our, our like our memory space. Um, I, as a player, am never allowed to flip my tiles back over unless the other players tell me to do stuff. This is not for me to touch. This is for the other players to track. Um, but it does start to get pretty pretty wild, pretty confusing. And again, it's about this, this building of history. This is not really a game that people would be good at, necessarily. 
if you just came in and started trying to make guesses without seeing what people have done here. Um, right? In the past, if you can't watch this thing track by. Now, it is possible that if someone makes a move, you could look at what is left over for them and, and get a good sense of what their tile might be. But this, this game is about generating history as you play it. And not just one person's, but potentially three players. And this goes up to five. Um, there is a two-player variance. You can play this two players. Um, there's also an advanced two-player one where you each basically play two characters at the same time. It's really, really wild. Um, a lot of weird stuff can happen in this game. And, and think about this. So I, I drew this six in this one, and I played the one here to say that my, my tile was lower than a one. And so they knew it wasn't a one. On my next turn, when it comes back around to me, I'm going to grab a new tile. And now I have choices to make. Now I have a two and a six, right? Well, <laughs> could I play the six? I mean, I could. I certainly could. That is legal to just play the six instead and change the number that I had. But I'm not allowed to tell people that I've done that. And I'm not allowed to change my numbers. So probably a bad choice. But if we're just hung up, then I can't do that. Now, sometimes you have to do it. For example, right now with this two and the six, um, I am not allowed to place on the hours because this is a legal placement for my two. So I could play there and I'm good. So I can't choose to do that. Um, if there was a force in here that forced me to get rid of my six, I would have to do it because that's how the game works. That just makes it a little bit more complicated. Of course, there are quite a few of these. This is the tell card, the chalice. The tell card says play one of your fates here. If you do say whether your remaining fate is higher than the one you played. So, automatically, that's one that you could play anything on. And uh, people will learn information about it. Um, uh, this one is even. If the sum of your fates is even, play one of them here. So that's very helpful to find out if your, your remaining one is odd or even. Um, if the sum of your fates is 7, 8, or 9, place one here. When your fates is higher, if the sum of your fates is 5 or less, place one here. So there's, there's a ton of different things in here. Blah, 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 blah. Um, it's so good. It's so good. Factor. If one of your fates is double or triple the other, play one of them here. That's a card, right? There's tons of math in here that you can use already. There's tons of probability and logic that you get to do. Someone was mentioning that in the chat, and it's absolutely true. And these abilities that you have in the back are very, very helpful, and you should definitely use them as you play this game. Uh, so again, like I said, the goal of this game is to get seven correct guesses before the doom track runs out which again happens by these cards fading or by you making incorrect guesses so you don't want to jump in on a guess at any point um <laughs> you you start this at zero in easy mode um for a slightly more difficult game you set it oops you set evil at two or at four or even at six um you can set it at six where if you if one bad thing happens um you're done it's terrifying <laughs> um Oh, there is a rule. There's a rule I'm missing here. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, but I'm blanking on what it is. Unfortunately, there is... Oh, there is a rule about the fading. Oh, my gosh. I got the fading completely wrong. <laughs> uh, when these fade, the Doom track advances by two, unless you have made a correct prediction this round. So making correct choices... Even if this gets three tiles on it, if you can figure out what my token is this turn and this fades, we don't actually lose any doom. Um, this just, we get this ability to our ability stack and, uh, and the game will continue. But if we do not make a correct prediction that turn, bad stuff can happen. So your placement is not only about, am I going to, um, excuse me, am I going to make a you know, a bit of logical evidence if I'm going to convince you what my tiles are. Is that a very helpful thing to do? Can, if I place here on this plus minus two, you have to make a correct guess this turn. Is my placement going to do that? Will I be forced to place in one of those spots? And that'll seriously hurt our chances. All that stuff is, is, uh, oh my gosh, ridiculous. Um, but a ton of fun. And it, it really is a fun game. I really do like it. It's if you don't like deduction games, do not play this game. Just don't, because it, it'll it'll be frustrating. But uh, I love this game. 
Um, I love it so much. I think it's a ton of fun. And it's ton to, it's, it gives your brain a cool like workout where you're actually doing this sort of uh, logical process. I mean, it's hard. It's hard stuff. We don't get the opportunity to do that enough. I know that I teach geometry, so I get to do proofs all the time. But I know that in the rest of our lives, we don't get that much deduction, which is unfortunate because it's fun. Um, what else do I have to say about Shipwreck Arcana? Um, I think that's about what I got right now. <laughs> um, gosh, it's a good game. It's just a good game. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so definitely check this one out if you're in for, for that sort of, of, you know, um, deduction, deducing. And also if you want to watch history happen in a game, because this, this is definitely a game where that advancement of history is really, really important. Um, like I said, uh, Markovian games are really interesting to me because they are games that you can just sit down and play, even if you weren't watching the last half hour of the game. And I think that in many senses, those are good games. Those are, those are really, really nice. Uh, I played a lot of I ran a lot of games of Pathfinder, like public Pathfinder, and strangers would come and sit down at my table and, and we'd play together and it'd be great and a ton of fun. And one of the distinctions about players that I was able to observe as that happened is that there were a lot of players who were invested in the entire adventure. They wanted to play the game from start to finish. They were here, they were, let's go, let's do this. Um, and every action influenced every other action as you go. And for those players, that was a lot of fun. They really liked that. There are other players who had more fun for themselves by basically, you know, almost checking out, like, especially during combat, which is a moment that, you know, I have my turn and then like 10 minutes later, I get a turn again, stuff like that. And so rather than watching what all the other players did and like build this, oh, okay, we're going to be part of like this tactical offensive. We're going to, okay, here we go. Um, they would mostly just sit back and then on their turn, pop up and they would say, what's going on right now? Okay, that's I. This is what I do. Their action was now based on the present state, and the past didn't really matter them, to them a whole lot. You know, if players, rather than like, well, I'm gonna climb up this tree, I'm gonna get in a position, and then once you were flanking over there, I'm gonna attack from this side. From it's gonna be like this, super cool. Um, and they were not interested in that so much. It was just, oh, is it my turn? Cool. Uh, is there someone in front of me? I hit them. Um, roll some dice. I remember playing with a friend in high school who slept through a game because he hadn't slept a whole lot lately. And we would just nudge him and he would just roll. He would have dice like in his hand. He would fall asleep with dice in his hand, I swear. And he would just wake up and roll them and then go like pick him up and go back to sleep. <laughs> it was one of the funniest things that I've ever seen. But he played Markovian D&D &D 100%. Um, wow. And it was fun. <laughs> so as you're looking at games, as you're studying games, as you want to get better at games, think about games that by their nature are Markovian. What that means is you you can't build, well, you can. You don't necessarily need to build a strategy that goes turn after turn after turn after turn. What you're going to do instead is look at the game at the moment that you're playing it and decide what the best move is. It's not necessarily based on what you did last turn or the turn before or the turn before, like a deck builder or or any kind of engine building game is, is definitely not very Markovian. <laughs> Some of them can be. But, uh, but it is an important distinction. It is a cool classification for games, and it will certainly help you get better as you start to develop all sorts of strategies and tactics um, in any game you're playing. All right. Oven tells me that we're very, very close to the end. I want to check in on the Twitch chat real quick. Cool. It looks like all of our questions have been checked out. I hope so. If you've got any last minute ones, uh, go ahead and drop them in there. Um, also, do a quick Twitter check since I promised that I would. Do, 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 do. And, oh, very cool. Everybody is super nice on Twitter. Um, okay, we got some questions, and I can answer them there. Today, we got to talk about two Markovian games. We got to talk about The Wonderful Rise of Tribes, which I can't pick up the box because I just put all the pieces in the box while I was cleaning it up. Uh, and also The Shipwreck Arcana, which is a game that I really, really, really enjoy. Um, and is one of the glariest games I can think of. It's a very, very pale font right there. But if you are interested in these games, definitely check them out. Study Markovian games, study the process of building momentum in a game and whether that is possible or not. Um, it'll make you a better gamer for sure. If you've enjoyed our show, um, uh, my name is Richard and this has been Atomic Game Theory. You can learn so much 
more stuff because I can't stop talking about game theory. Check out AtomicGameTheory.com and you will find past episodes of this show, um, older videos. There are also lots of posts because I love to write about game theory as well. You can also follow me on Twitter at Armalina and learn a bunch of stuff there because I just can't be quiet. You know me. Um, all right. All right. Well, that's been everything. This has been a ton of fun. I've really, really enjoyed talking about these games. I hope you have learned something about uh, about Markovian systems and apply that throughout your lives, or at the very least, in your games. And I hope that it makes you a better and stronger board gamer, because that's what we're all here to do. Uh, thank you so much for being here at Game School. I will see you, I hope, next week, Sunday at 11 a.m. PST. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye!